Okay, in the last section we talked about kind of the enzymes in terms of thermodynamics and how um, the energy releasing pathways are used to power the energy requiring pathways. So now what we're going to talk about is really enzymes and, and this is kind of really the, the important portion of the, the actual uh, chapter here and the things that you really want to take away from um, like how these enzymes work and kind of what their ultimate goal is and then tie it in with some of the stuff that we just talked about here. So what enzymes basically do is they speed up a chemical reaction of course and they do so by lowering the amount of energy that's required in order for that chemical reaction to occur. And basically enzymes are proteins, okay? And some of the enzymes can be, um, these enzymes can be kind of packaged or immobilized for a variety of types of uses. So if you think of things like lactate, for instance, and, and things that people with lactose intolerance might take, that's a, a packaged form of an enzyme. So um, the immobilized enzymes now, these things are important because they're, they have a wide variety of uses and we're going to go through uh, an enzyme lab in a class where we're going to immobilize uh, um, the lactate pills and we're going to use them to generate some lactose free milk. Okay, And some of the uh, um, advantages for immobilizing these enzymes is that what you can do is you can increase the concentration of the enzyme to kind of increase the rate of the reaction. Um, these uh, enzymes that get immobilized um, they're, they're, what it does is it makes it very easy to, to reuse these enzymes because, for instance, like if you use the alginate beads that we're going to um, be using, these things trap the enzymes, but then you can kind of wash the, the milk solution over the top of them, and then you don't really have to separate anything out because the, the uh, enzyme is in these beads, which are just captured in, in the container, and it makes, you, it makes it very easy to continually reuse these over and over and over again. And if, you're, if this is something that you're doing in industry, and one of the uh, things that you want to do is kind of save money, uh, one of the ways to do it is to make sure that you're not wasting these uh, enzymes or um, you're maximizing the amount of use that you can get out of them and so forth, okay? Um, so what the, the process of uh, immobilization does is it really is it makes these things um, more, you know, I guess more easily reused, but in addition, it, it makes them less susceptible to being broken down by some of the processes that you might be uh, using to produce the, the, the product that you're making, okay? Um, so a lot of these types of enzymes that get immobilized, um, what they're basically done is they're, they're an aggregate of the enzyme, like with an enzyme pill such as lactate, um, you can attach them to the surfaces of certain objects and then wash the things over, or a solution over this object, and then it'll, it'll continually get broken down. Or as I mentioned a second ago, you can uh, um, kind of entrap them within gels, these alginate beads that we're gonna get, um, we're gonna make. They're, they're just like jelly or jello. They're you know very soft, but they've got enzymes all over the top of them. So they can very easily and quickly catalyze the chemical reaction. So these enzymes now, they have a wide variety of uses. And I'm just gonna go through a few here and you're gonna wanna make sure that you can know these um, if you're, you're ever asked to give you know some of the uses of enzymes and provide some examples with them. Um, so they're found in detergents, okay, washing detergents and so forth, because uh, you can, in, in, within these detergents, you can put proteases to break down proteins, lipases uh, to break down lipids and so forth. And what this can do is help clean clothes. So like when you're wearing your clothes, for instance, your skin, the oils from your skin, the proteins from your skin are, are what essentially make your clothes dirty. And the detergents help kind of, uh, and the enzymes contained within these detergents help to um, you know, rid the clothing of those. Um, the textile industry, like carpets and fabrics and things like this, this uses uh, enzymes to process the fibers, in some cases make them shiny, uh, in some cases clean them up, uh, make them white, etc. So there's a variety of uses the textile industry has for them. Brewing industry, of course, is going to make use of, of various forms of enzymes to make beers and wines and spirits and things like that. Um, medicine and biotechnology, as you'll see when we go through and do a couple of the labs that we do, um, makes use of enzymes. Um, they're used in the food industry, for instance, like a clarifier for juices and jams and things like that. Um, pectinase, it's going to kind of get the uh, cloudiness out of the, the fruit juice that you might be making. Um, renin is used in cheese production. Um, that's a protein that's found and released by the kidney of, of uh, um, animals. And then the paper industry is going to use these things to process the, the wood pulp that's used to make the, the paper. Okay, so there's a wide variety of, of uses for them. Um, now, within the cell now, these enzymes 
what they are is proteins and they're going to bind to a specific substrate. They're going to break this down and in this process you're going to have a variety of things that are going to be forming as these reactants get converted into products. So for instance the reactants or the substrates here, these things bind with the enzyme and form what's known as the enzyme substrate complex. And when that's happening this is basically taking these two reactive types of chemicals and forcing them together um, very close in a, a, a way that's you know conducive to the chemical reaction. And then during this process, this is where we're gonna get these products being given off. And then as with all enzymes, the enzyme gets regenerated and then can do the same thing over and over again. So these enzymes aren't gonna be consumed during the chemical reaction. They're just gonna do their job many, many times. They're gonna do it over and over and they're gonna be able to do it very rapidly. And they're going to allow this these chemical reactions to occur very, very quickly. Okay, so um, in this example, this would be um, a hexokinase. This is a, an enzyme that's going to break down, for instance, glucose here. So the red, red object or the red molecule here is glucose. The blue object is the large enzyme, the hexokinase. And you can see here what the induced fit is. So you can see um, up here at the top, the uh, actual enzyme is a little bit further open. And then when the glucose gets in there, you're going to see it kind of clamps down and squeezes down on it like you see down here, and then that would be what we know as the induced fit. And this is where the um, enzyme is wrapping closely around the substrate there, or the reactants, and allowing the chemical reaction to occur very quickly, okay? And there's a variety of ways now in which the uh, enzyme is gonna act to lower that activation energy, okay? So you can see the black line here, this represents the amount of energy that would be required if, um, the enzyme were not available. And then you can see the red line here. This shows you the amount of energy that's required for the chemical reaction to occur with the enzyme. So you can see what this is doing is this um, enzyme is lowering the energy of activation or the EA here. The activation energy is being lowered and that's what's going to allow the reaction to occur more quickly and more easily, okay? So you can see in this particular case here, we've got these reactants, okay? And then you down here, you've got the products. So if you have, if you were asked what type of a reaction is this, is this an endergonic or an exergonic reaction, what would you say? Okay, so I'll give you the answer to that in class. So now the ways in which the, the enzymes work to lower the activation energy. The active site can act as a mediator now, and this is going to bring these uh, two um, reactants together in a way that makes the, the uh, chemical reaction more favorable. Um, the substrate molecules can kind of be stretched or stressed and strained into a, a transition state that allows these bonds to get stressed a little bit and the chemical reaction to actually occur as these bonds get broken. Um, the third way is the enzyme can make that microenvironment more favorable. So if we look here, for instance, at, at this picture, you can see um, right here, let me change the color. If you look here, you can see this would be the microenvironment, and because it's kind of squished around, it's forced anything that might be uh, around this uh, glucose molecule out, so it makes that microenvironment much more favorable. And then occasionally these enzymes in the active site can kind of participate covalently in this chemical reaction, but it's important to keep in mind that while it might participate very briefly in the chemical reaction, it's not consumed, so it very quickly goes back to its native state or its original state and can then um, kind of catalyze this reaction again, okay? So this enzyme catalysis now, it involves molecular motion. So these, these products might be, or these, these reactants, I should say rather, might be running into each other, you know, in various ways, but they only run into each other a certain way allows this chemical reaction to occur. So the reaction might occur very slowly, but what that enzyme does is it helps speed up the reaction by you know, taking these two reactants and putting them in, in the configuration that they need to be in order to react, okay? And this molecular motion is going to contribute to the enzyme's kind of ability to do this. So in other words, if we heat it up, we're going to be able to make this reaction go a little bit quicker. If we cool it down, we're going to slow it down a little bit. And this is just a result of this, this molecular motion that's actually occurring there, okay? But 
there comes a point where if we add too much heat, we're going to denature this enzyme. We're going to break it apart. We're going to break it down and it's not going to be able to kind of uh, function effectively. Okay. So these extreme temperature variations can, uh, can affect the protein's secondary tertiary structure and prevent it from actually being able to do its job. pH can do the same thing. Um, too acidic, too basic, or, or something that's out of the normal range of pH of the actual um, uh, enzyme can have an effect on it. Um, uh, the amount of salt concentration, because so those are three things that can uh, affect it. Um, the salt concentration, um, the pH, and the temperature can all have an effect on the enzyme's function. So you get too many ions in there or something that's going to affect the actual structure of that protein, and it's going to prevent it from working. Okay, And it's important to know here, too, that some... Uh, um, organisms live in these extreme environments. So they need to have these extreme temperatures in order to work. And if you take them out of that environment and put them in a more temperate type of an environment, they may not work. Some live in very acidic environments and you take them away from that acidic environment, they may not work and so on and so forth. So if you just think, for instance, the pH of your stomach is very acidic. It's got a pH around two. Um, and some of those enzymes are primed to work in that particular environment. And if you put them in an environment where the pH isn't around two, then they're not going to work as effectively. And there's a couple of other things here, too, that we should mention that help uh, these enzymes function. You have cofactors and you have coenzymes. And what these cofactors typically are are these inorganic types of metal ions that are going to be... Um, uh, helping in, in some way, shape, or form, the enzymes function more effectively. And if these things aren't available, the enzyme isn't going to work as well. And then you have some coenzymes, which are basically vitamins. So when you take vitamins, um, you're often eating these coenzymes, which are helping these enzymes work more efficiently. And, you know, if you eat healthy diets, if you take vitamins, you're typically getting cofactors and coenzymes in the uh, um, vitamin or in that healthy food, and that's what's gonna help your, your enzymes, your metabolism, your, your overall health um, from the things that you're getting from that, okay? So some of the other things uh, that can affect an enzyme's function, you can continually add more and more substrate up to a point where the reaction will continue to increase, and then when you get to that point, it's not going to go any faster because the, the reaction is going to be saturated, as it says here. You can add more and more enzymes, and that's going to speed up the chemical reaction also, and it's going to speed it up really to a point where, there, where it's either saturated or there's no more um, substrate available in order to be converted. Okay, So you might have something that would look like this in terms of a graph, and it's going to increase and then it's gonna level off, and this would be the point of saturation, okay? And then um, if the, the reaction kind of speeds up, goes, and then drops off here, um, you could say that there's, there's no more product being made because all of the uh, reactants have been used up, all right? So now, uh, some of the things that affect an enzyme's function, you can have some inhibitors, okay? So they're either going to slow or stop the enzymatic activity. And you have competitive inhibitors and you have non-competitive inhibitors. With competitive inhibitors, what they're doing is they're competing with substrate molecules for the active site, okay? And in non-competitive inhibition, what you have is these, these uh, substances are binding to a spot other than the active site, and they're slowing down or stopping that actual chemical reaction. So if we look a little look at a figure here, in the normal binding, let me change my color. In the normal way in which the enzyme functions here, you can see that this substrate is going to bind to this active site right here, and it's going to give you the products, the chemical reaction is going to occur. With competitive inhib inhibition, you have this competitive inhibitor here, which is competing with the substrate for the active site, and that's going to slow that chemical reaction down. And then in non-competitive inhibition, again, like we said, this is binding to a spot other than the active site, but you can see here that it's changing the active site, and that's slowing or stopping the, the actual chemical reaction from occurring. Okay, so what you can actually do is look at some of those assignments that we've given in class and you can see the different ways in which these graphs kind of depict competitive versus non-competitive inhibition. And you're going to want to make sure that you understand how those things work and what those graphs are showing and you, that you could actually identify them on a quiz or a test. And if you're having difficulty with that, make sure that we talk about this in class. Okay. 
All right, so um, the next thing that we're gonna talk about here will be the HL only material, and this is how we can regulate enzymatic activity. Okay, so if any of that stuff that we went over earlier, um, if you got any questions on it, make sure you write them down, and if not, then we'll talk to you soon.